So my role here, my name is David Willey, I'm the curator of the museum and my job here is really look after the collection, trying to grow the collection and one thing we're very conscious of at the moment with the 100th anniversary is to face outwards to the media, to television companies, um, telling the story. This is a great opportunity for us to tell the story of the development of the tank, British invention in the First World War. So I consider that my job here and, um, and part of the pleasure of my job is making sure that people come here and get the same thrill that I got when I was a kid looking at all these amazing vehicles. Um, I think it's a good one because if both of us get what we want from the relationship, it's a great relationship. So, for example, we've got the collection here as a resource. So, World of Tanks sometimes come along, they scan vehicles, they research about vehicles in our archive. We've got a fantastically big archive here that's got plans, drawings, accounts in. So, that works very well for them. For us, of course, World of Tanks is getting a new audience. Um, 72 million players worldwide, you know, that, that idea that some of those people are bound to want to know a bit more about the reality of tanks and everything. So that works very well for us, that some of them are wanting to find out more about the real things. And that, as long as we keep the relationship that both of us gains from it, I think that's a, you know, a really good win-win situation. So. Well, what, what we found interesting is war games are sometimes they're being led by the interest of the players and so on the forums the players are really interested in some of the more obscure vehicles the prototypes tanks that may never have been made and that's where we may be able to come in because we have drawings of some of these tanks we have a number of prototypes here we have a number of one-off vehicles for us previously there was very little interest in those apart from in a very minor the tank enthusiasts would find those interesting. The fact now there's a huge audience of people that are talking on forums, want to know more, want to discover, and then the next minute that tank is therefore encouraged to be in the game, that we find really interesting. So, and it's great because it, it casts a light on areas of the collection that previously was perhaps only one or two people who have very, very specialists were interested in. So. I, th I think for us that, that idea that we could say to World of Tanks, come and look at all these different vehicles, actually World of Tanks are responding a lot of the time to the interest being shown by the players. And they're the ones who are finding it fascinating to see all these odd prototypes around. So It'll, it, We work out at the moment we've got quarter of a million photographs. It will take us at the rate we're going 30 years to catalogue those photographs. Now when we can use we're doing an experiment with World of Tanks where we're seeing if we can put them online. If 50 World of Tanks players who have got the right credits, who i.e. they know about the subject, if they all 50 of them say this is a Panzerkampfwagen 1 command tank, we can be fairly assured that we're getting a, a sort of a, a crowdsourcing cataloguing system going that we can then put the material out there. So because we won't have the hours in the day to go through those quarter of a million photographs and catalogue. Do we have to wait 30 years? We'd much rather though that material was made available now. And even if it's miscatalogued, we've got the opportunity once it's digitised online that other people can come back and say, no, you've got that wrong. It's actually this model. Or by the way, this is said to be the Russian front. We now know this is Romania in 1944. So that, that level, you know, by using modern technology and the internet, and that's where having partners like World of Tanks can do us a tremendous favour, because however forward-looking we like to think we are in using new media, etc., to do these things, we're going to need people with the resources, the way of getting to that number of people. Fantastic for us. We can make a film on our website, 15,000 people see it. If we give it to one of the World of Tanks vloggers, a quarter of a million people will see it just like that. Yes. So that's a better way of getting our story out there if we can use people in that manner. You know, it works for us and it works for World of Tanks because they're getting that information and they're getting that, that content for their 
for their game and their, their fans, their users. Well, we've done a number of projects with World of Tanks. Like, for example, Victor Kisley, very keen that he funded our education room. Mm. So, you know, we have a, a lot of school children coming here. They learn about World War One, World War Two as part of their, the national curriculum. So we've, we've had some money to help us restore vehicles. Um, you know, they've given us some money to help on putting exhibitions. So that idea that they're prepared to put some money back into all these areas of the heritage I, you know I've just got to say is admirable I would say that wouldn't I because we've benefited but you know at the same time why not because you can see again there's an advantage there for both parties so great if we can keep that going it's the museum was set up after the first world war really as a teaching collection for soldiers this is where the British army came to train with the tank in world war one it's carried on doing so but really it was in the 1960s that it really started looking much more towards the public. We still teach soldiers to this day, it's still very important that they learn the heritage, they learn the examples from the past. But um, we've now got 200,000 visitors a year and again, especially with things like World of Tanks where so many people are now aware of the subject by playing the game that we have a big online audience. So they're looking on the websites, we do regular little features. So even if they can't visit us, they can find out more about us and, uh, and learn things about the subject. So, uh, you know, again, that's something we're, we're, we, we're obviously very much aware of. Not everyone's going to make it to this very museum. We hope they do um, one day. You know, they, they, they decide, look, I've heard enough about it. I'm sick of watching all these videos. I'm going to go and see it myself, you know. So, you know, and that, that's really good because uh, if we can persuade people, but at the same time, if they can't come, there's always something they're going to get from us whether that's via World of Tanks, via our own website, whatever. So I, I think we're very conscious that we're very lucky because we have this amazing collection. You know, there's a great story, you know, all the way through here. That idea of, again, for museums now entering, just not just us, but other museums, realising that actually the physical visitor is not going to be your only visitor. So, you know, that online audience, those, all those other ways that people are going to be experiencing your collection in the future. And how do you get that out there? You know, the fact that I could put a photograph from our archive in a case here, but we've got it for another area, you know, that we've got over 200,000 Facebook followers. If we put that one photograph on our Facebook site, that's the same number of people will have seen that, just like that, that will see the whole physical museum within the year. We have 200,000 visitors during the year. So the fact we can do that just on the Facebook site that's a new way that a museum can get its story on that one image out. And, and that's something, you know, it's not just us. Many museums are trying to work out what's the best way of doing this, you know. Uh, and in the old days, you might have had a fear. If you put it all out for free online, no one will want to come here. Rubbish. I think all it does, it just whets more people's appetites for the topic, you know. So I, I'm, I'm, I don't have any worries about that at all. Um, but if we can use those medias and those ways of doing it, great. Well, tomorrow you're going to go on a visit around and you'll see our storage shed, okay? And everyone walks in there and you go out onto a balcony and you look over and I bet you'll hear everyone go, oh, wow, it's unbelievable because it's like um, schoolboy's dream. Indiana Jones, you know, the big shed full of all the things locked yes. away and you're thinking, what are all these treasures? And you see all that. We're never going to run out of, problem, of stories here, okay? We get, you see our archive and library. Boxes of stuff we haven't even store, sorted yet. You know, uh, you open them and they're full of drawings or there's uh, other ones, photographs, letters, diaries, amazing stories that, that way. So for us, it's never going to be, you know, I, I can't remember all the things I've seen here and I've got quite a good visual memory, you know, thinking, oh, we've got something, you know. So that idea that how do we look at a collection like this? How do we find ways of not diminishing that simple fact of you watch tomorrow when a family comes in. I've seen people here, the journalists do it, they do every time. They walk in, they look at all this stuff and they have to go and touch it. Touch it and feel that it's real and it's made of metal and you have that feeling you want to just make, I can't push this anywhere. That's a great experience, okay? We don't want to denigrate from that. But also, we've got to do a show here and a display that doesn't make you feel you've got to spend the whole week, you, you know, because there's be a tank overload. So, you know, it's, it's how you pace yourself, how you get those stories out, how do you refresh the stories, and every generation is going to want a slightly different version of history.
So each generation needs their, you know, we have national myths, we have things we want to know about. We're very conscious here, there's some stories we don't want to get forgotten. Now isn't it weird that just as the Second World War generation dies out, we have some revisionist historians saying, well maybe the Nazis weren't that bad. You know, bollocks, we've got to make sure we've got the story here that people don't start getting the wrong end of a story, it's evidence as well as an entertainment and a, hopefully an educational experience. So, so you know, we're very conscious that there's some important core things that we must always do, but look at all those other wonderful things we can bring in as part of it. And 100th anniversary is, you know, we're shining a light back on World War I and the first tanks. We'll, we'll have other anniversaries for Second World War, for other events. Britons just were looking at the Gulf War, okay, 20 years ago. So that's amazing that that generation are now coming here. The one moment were young men, now they're bringing their families, or even in some cases grandchildren, and saying, look, this is what we did. So, you know, that's, it's always going to evolve. I think it's one problem these museums always have is space because these are big things, tanks, and it's not easy to move them around. So just being able to have places that you could do dioramas or put vehicles together, be able to move them around without too much trouble, without feeling you've got to demolish the building, you know, because there's so many ways you could tell the story, you know, the uh, ideas of subject areas, of campaigns, of countries' attitudes to how they would do. So having space to do that is always going to be a problem. If I was honest though, I still think that the, 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 the best thing for us is making sure we don't lose sight of the visitor because the visitor is what pays my wages. It's also making sure that they get that sense of wow and enjoyment that they want to learn and understand it. And I think, you know, if we get that wrong, we don't deserve our job here because look at this as a subject matter. It's fantastic. You know, you've got God's gift of a subject matter. You've got whopping great machines that people never see normally. You've got defeat of fascism, 20th century history, love, death, you know, all here. So it's a really good one to be able to, you know, to, to get across to people. We've just got to make sure we never, never lose sight of that you know we're, we can be big boys playing with toys but whoa hang on we're doing it for a reason well, we're just to give you an indication today we're entertaining you guys but this afternoon before when you guys were doing other things we were having another meeting about tank fest so it starts from the minute the previous year we do an evaluation so we look at what went right what went wrong what could we do better and start planning straight away for the following year so a lot of work from the whole museum all the different departments have a little, something to do with Tankfest. So a lot of work goes on to that. And one of the things, you know, for our own sake, every year it seems to get better. We like to think um, we're almost certainly this year going to be sold out. So if people want to go, buy your ticket beforehand. You know, it's one of those really important things because it's great for us, but it'd be very disappointing, like we had last year, people flying in from Japan. They bought the tickets, they booked the hotels, for the aeroplane everything else but they didn't buy the ticket for the day and they turned up here and we were full so that's a really awkward thing to have to explain to people like uh, so all i'd say is go online you can see all about tank fest there's videos of previous years you see the type of thing that goes on if you do want to come buy your ticket well in advance you know get get that one off because otherwise it would be very disappointing to turn up here and find you the wrong side of the fence